serve 2021 and the goal of this meeting is to encourage uh, lay people to serve their community there is a need to uh, meet the needs of the community and it is the goal of this uh, uh, conference to uh, give you a little encouragement and to help you get a vision of why we need to be doing this work. I'm Dr. Eddie Ramirez. I am the director of the Adventist Whole Health Network, who is uh, organizing this meeting. And this meeting is going to be very special. Uh, we have a special guest. Um, we have um, Adrian Brutus, Dr. Brutus. He is uh, an internal medicine uh, physician and comes from a long line of uh, uh, missionaries, uh, uh, teachers, and, um, and physicians that have uh, impact many people in, uh, around the world. Uh, we also have uh, Esther Trevino. You will also uh, hear from both of them uh, uh, tonight. Uh, she is leading the health training at Wimar Institute, and she is going to be uh, sharing with you 
uh, practical ways of doing medical missionary work, things such as coaching, things uh, such as um, TCI, you will learn about that uh, key word also on, on Sunday, things such as hydrotherapy and other simple remedies. So this is going to be a very special program this weekend, and I hope you enjoy. And for those of you listening online, um, you're also very welcome. Feel free to share the uh, link with others as uh, we want to cover as many people as possible with this important message. So let us uh, start with a word of prayer, and uh, we'll start our conference. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for the traveling mercies. And Lord, as we start this conference, we want to put it at your feet. We pray, Lord, that uh, it may inspire many to continue and finish the work that you have given. We thank you for giving us this opportunity of being here, and it may it be a blessing to each one of us individually. We thank you, and we ask you for your spirit during this conference. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, tonight uh, we're going to start um, with our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Adrian Brutus, and um, he is... Uh, uh, somebody with uh, many talents, and um, you're going to be inspired to hear uh, the message that he has for us. Uh, he's going to be doing a series on how to serve others. Adrian, it is your time. Microphone. Hello, hello. Okay. Good evening. Happy Sabbath. It's, it's such a wonderful experience to be able to be here with you guys today. It's actually a dream come true for myself. Um, as Dr. Ramirez was saying, um, I grew up in the Adventist University in northern Mexico, in Montemorelos, Mexico. Um, and growing up, when, my, when I was 15, 16, I wanted to go to academy, and I was passionate about aviation, and I wanted to come to an academy that had an aviation program, so BMA was right at the top of my list. And I remember making my way up from, from northern Mexico into BMA with my father, hitting a couple of academies, and halfway through the trip, uh, my dad had an emergency. He had to return to the hospital, and I, was, I ended up stranded in Tennessee, in an academy in Tennessee. Not as beautiful as this one, but the experience was amazing. And that's where I actually met Dr. Ramirez back in the day. Now, uh, can you go to the next film? I, I, I'm actually... Oh, thank you. So just to give you an idea, I learned that there's a lot of people from Mexico here. On the left side, you're going to see where Monterey is, and 30 minutes from there, you have the Adventist University. There's where, um, uh, in the northern part of Mexico, two hours from the border of Texas, and that's where I spent most of my early years. Then I came to the United States for high school. Then I ended up going back there for medical training and ultimately made my way over to uh, the Dayton area where Kettering, uh, the Adventist healthcare system has a couple of hospitals where I have the privilege to work with the community there, along with my wife who's doing residency in internal medicine. Now, when Dr. Ramirez asked me to talk to you guys about service, when I realized that I had a couple of, of, of talks to talk to you guys about that, I realized I wanted to start from the beginning. Everybody here has a different journey, has a different goal, has a different pathway that's you know, walking around a different race that you're running. But despite the fact that you may be running a race, you may not get the prize at the end of the race. Now, before we talk about service, I want to ask you guys to take a step back, take a look at the reality of our time. We're living in the ends of time, and nobody knows it better than Satan, okay? And what's happening in our generation is that Satan doesn't really need you to go out there and be engaged into open sinning, paganism, whatever you want to call it. All you need to do is get distracted from the goal. That's all Satan wants to get you to do. And at the end of the race, you're going to find out that you're not going to, meet, you're not going to get the prize. Now, 
how is Satan doing this? Take a look at the right. This generation is, has been exposed to the media like no other. If you end up turning your phones or the TV or whatever you may be engaged with, you're going to see that every other news is coronavirus, coronavirus, you know, people dying, wars, multiple things that ultimately gets you to get stressed out. That's a subtle tactic from the devil. Now, stress is good up to a certain point, but after you reach, after you cross a certain mark, you start making mistakes. You lose sight of things and what's important. If you look at the right, social media. I'm pretty sure you guys are experts in social media by now. Now, I'm pretty sure that the guys that ended up coming with this social media experiment, I want to believe in my naive mind that they had the greater good of humanity in, you know, in, uh, at stake. But this has morphed into a machine of selfish brewing. Selfishness is brewed on a daily basis. It's water on a daily basis. Now, everybody, all you have to do is open up your Facebook, your Instagram. Everybody's always trying to one-up each other. Oh, he has this thing. He has this car. He has this clothes. He has this bag. You know, this, this, and that. And then Satan, it's, screw, it's, it's, it's screwing your perception of reality and what success looks like. Instead of focusing and keeping your eyes on the things that matter, everybody's down here trying to chase this dream that doesn't amount to anything. And that's one of the clever ways for the devil to get into your brain and get you to not be engaged in the things that matter. Before I get you to, t before I talk, and bear with me for a second. The next slide, as I get to talk to folks in the church service, I've come to realize that a lot of people don't think they're successful or anything. And I will start in this conference, a lot of you guys are going to spearhead movements where ministries are going to get to be, uh, uh, get to serve people, engage people in service. And you cannot get people to be engaged if they don't think they're successful at, at, at anything. And I used to think, oh, that's something out there, not in the church. But no, I work in a church environment and a lot of people are depressed. A lot of people think they're useless. When somebody comes and asks them, can you come and help? They're like, no, I'm not that good at anything. I'm, I'm, I'm actually kind of okay. And that's it. No, you have to realize that you were meant for a purpose. You were given a purpose. And I'm going to start, I'm going to take it to this extreme because I know there's a lot of young people here. So one of the extreme measures or example of success is this. One in 400 trillion. What does that even mean? Anybody have an idea? What's that odds? One in 400 trillion is a chance of you being born. When you and I were conceived, we fought against millions and millions and millions of sperms and I ultimately made it. So you are successful. In other words, if I were to grab a quarter and I flip it 30,000 times in a row, what are the chances of the coin landing the same time, heads or tails? Anybody? On its edge. On its edge. That is a miracle. We're not here by chance. We're here because of a miracle. Okay? Now, I'm going to take it to the other extreme. Your birth was not a mistake. You have a purpose here. Now, bringing it home with COVID, this is out of control. I'm a physician. that I've been in charge of the COVID unit. We take cycles, so we're not exposed all the time. But I've been half of the pandemic. I've been treating those patients. And it's so sad to see how many people have died. 65 million people will die this year in the world. Here in America, 7,000 people will die today. By the end of this talk, a couple hundred people will be dead in the United States. Is it going to be you or me? And if it's not, why are we alive? How in the world did you manage to survive the pandemic and be here in this exact moment? That's not a random act of chance. Or Now, whenever you get take a step back into the perspective and realize, wait a minute, I'm actually have been successful at being born and surviving the pandemic, then why am I here? What is my purpose? What's going on? And look, Satan is super clever, and he realizes that everybody will start asking this question at some point in their brain. And the second you start doing that, he has all this array of answers for you to say, come here, come this way. You're looking for a path? I have all these paths for you. Um, so if you can tell, LNG White talks about Satan's constant effort is to misrepresent the character of God, the nature of sin, and the real issues at stake in the great controversy. Again, everybody has a different agenda. And then, when I was talking about Satan trying to lure you in different ways, 
there's so many motivational speakers out there, some quite famous. This is a billion dollar industry and they, they're quite good. And I remember going to one of the conferences when I was in residency and I realized that the guy was so good that 98% of what he said was good, but only 2% was clever lies and deceit geared to get you to turn, turn 10 degrees to the left from your goal and totally miss the mark. So that's all it takes. 10 degrees to the left, you run the, the whole life thinking you're doing great, you're achieving all your goals, and when you, at the end of your life, you're completely empty. Imagine this is the power of Satan and what's going on at hand. Now, you guys are young. A lot of people are running, uh, a lot of people, and you guys seem fit. I'm not sure if you guys run marathons or whatnot, but imagine you're running the race. You're running the race. You take a step back. You realize, okay, we're in the times in the end, the great controversy. We're almost at the end, at the finish mark. You're like, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. But right before you said, you know, let me take a break. Let me take a selfie. Let me show everybody how good I am. And then you click, you take one snap, two snaps, and you see people passing left and right of you. And you're like, ah, oh, it's fine, it's going to be okay. And then you finally get a photo you like. You're like, okay, wait a minute, let me, take, let me edit it and shape it and post it online. And by the time you're done, the race is finished. And you totally missed the mark. Why? Because you fell prey to Satan's distraction. You do not want to take your eyes from the prize. Okay? Now, you want, I want you to understand what God wants you to know about success. If I ask you, who's the most successful man that ever walked in earth, who would you tell me? Nine out of ten people were going to say Jesus, right? But how did Jesus end up? Penniless, beaten, convicted criminal who was publicly executed. Yet one of the last things he said when he was about to die, it is finished. The reason why you are here... It's because you're meant to finish what God has called you to do. Keep that in mind. That's the reason why you're still alive. That's the reason why you were born. Now, when you lose sight of the perspective, you end up like this. Imagine, at the beginning of the year, 8 out of 10, 10 Americans were anxious. And this is not just a little stressed out, pathological anxiety. Where you don't know what to do, what to think. You develop this tunnel vision. You're stressed out. Anxious, sad, and angry. That's awful. Who wants to live in a world like that where everyone's uh, uh, stressed out? Now, trick question. Who is more anxious or stressed in this generation, men or female? Men or female? In 2021, according to the survey. Anybody guess? Somebody said female. How about young? Young guys, millennials, or older folks? Oh my gosh, you guys are quite good. <laughs> Turns out the females tend to be a little bit more anxious. And millennials, younger guys, why? Because they have lost sight of the track. How are you going to lose sight of the track in these times? Now, this is only, that is helpful for the guys who are trying to get people to be engaged into service. You have to realize why would you want to be engaged into service? What drives you into being, okay, I want to serve, I want to help people. And if you look at it, in human psychology, we have been able to identify a couple of things that drive your emotions, and it's quite interesting. The top one, self-actualization. That's quite selfish if you think about it. Self-esteem. And none of that is actually bad. But you want to be able to engage your membership in a way where that, those markers can grow in a way that is aligned with the ultimate purpose in our church. Now, this applies to you guys because I do know that when you're teenagers, when you're in high school, when you're young adults, it's very easy to say, you know what, this is not for me. That's why we have the chaplain. That's why we have the leaders and whatnot. But this is what God calls you to do. Ephesians 2.10, for we, not the pastor, we are God's handiwork created in Jesus Christ to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And as humans, we were born to do good works. And with the sinful nature, we ended up throwing everything away. And ultimately, Jesus Christ, through His love, came and gave His Son for us 
that we may be saved. And once we were redeemed, once again, what does Isaiah 4, 41, 9 says? Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called thee from the chief men thereof and said unto thee, you are my servant. Once again, it's not the pastor's job, it's not the chaplain, it's not the leader. You were born to be a successful servant of God. Never forget that because that's your ultimate mission. Now, I only have 20 minutes right now. Tomorrow I'm going to give you a pretty good example of what service looks like in today's day and age, working in a secular world. But where does this cigarette come from? I want to show you that the ultimate character of Christ is love. And whenever you want to engage with, pe with people, it doesn't matter what type of service or ministry you're working with, you want to do it with love. I obviously see patients for a living, and I had the pleasure of seeing this 88-year-old lady that came into my office smoking like a train. What do I mean by like that? She smoked two packs and a half per day, and she had smoked that for like 55, 60 years. That's over 40 cigarettes a day, okay? Now, when we come, what would you tell that lady that she's 89 years old? You know, she comes to your office and tells you, I'm smoking all that. Oh, you shouldn't quit. Why? Because you're going to die? She's 89 years old. She already outlived everybody. You know, our life expectancy in America is 78. So what would you tell her? The key is to drive or to find what's the motivating factor. Everybody here has a different motiva motivating factor for service and for change. So listen, she went home. After we had our talk, I realized what was going on. She came back a month later and she tells me, Dr. Bruce, I stopped smoking. I, stopped, I quit smoking. And let me ask you this. What do you guys think did the trick after 65 years of continuous smoking? Do you think it was a good therapist, phys psychology therapy? Do you think it was family nagging them? You know, you should quit, you should quit, it's going to be bad. Do you think it was one of those Chantix good medications? Do you think it was a good doctor? What do you think it was? Which one? Somebody? Anybody else? She went home, this was around Thanksgiving, and for the first time in Dayton, we have a, the, one of the biggest Air Force bases in the state, so a lot of people came uh, from their overseas appointments, and she managed to see her grandkids for the first time, and the kids came running to her house that were four, five, and six years of age, and you know little kids never die, lie, so they went, they ran up to her, and they said, Grammy, Grammy, and she was going to give him a hug, and this little girl told her, ew, Granny, you stink. I don't want to give you a kiss. <laughs> I don't want to hug you. And then the other two kids back up and like, no, I don't want to do this. And that broke her heart. And that did. And she said, you know what? I want love. I don't want this vice. I want love. The way to win people's heart is through love. Now, I'm going to cut it short because I believe somebody is speaking to me. But my ultimate point is to get you guys to realize that you're not here out of chance. You're not in BMA just because you chose this academy or anything, anything like that. You're here with the purpose. God created you with the mission. And that mission is for you to be engaged into service. The last message I want to do, and I want to be brief with that, it's that whenever you engage yourself in service, it's not about you giving a meal to a homeless person. It's not about you turning somebody into a vegetarian or into vegan. Because if you do that, you're not any different than any other non-for-profit organization that's trying to say, hey, be healthy. Is that the end goal? Be healthy? Question for you. Who's going to go to heaven? A vegan or a vegetarian? Who's going to make it? Somebody said, I don't know. See, it's, that's not the ultimate goal. That's a means to an end. Service, it's a mean to an end. So anytime you engage in service, you want to use it as a means to an end. What's the end? To allow the Holy Spirit to enter into your body so that you can share the love of Jesus Christ and ultimately bring people to the feet of Jesus. That's the ultimate goal in your service. Now the church has very specific guidelines into how to go about serving others. What does it mean to be a seven-day Adventist Christian in this day and age and how to engage into that? So tomorrow I'm going to give you examples of working in the hospital or mission life overseas taking care of these different items. 
Christ-like living. You cannot just go out there and help people if you're not exemplifying the life of Jesus Christ. Christ-like communicating. Listen to that. Our ultimate goal is to share the Bible's message and God and hope and salvation offered through the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you know what's sad? Nowadays, people don't even know what the gospel is about. And I'll tell you more about it next, uh, tomorrow because I have a nice presentation about that. How in the world can you go to church and not know what the gospel is about? But nowadays, we're living in this watered-down system in which it's all about us feeling good. And if we feel good and I'm good with my neighbor and myself, that's it. That's Jesus. That's not Jesus. This is the gospel, and that's what you want to gear your, your folks in ministry to do so. Um, Christ-like teaching, Christ-like healing. Oh, my gosh. As a church, we're pretty good like that. And I'm going to finish with those two points. Ultimately, we want to let people to affirm the biblical principles of well-being of the whole person. We make helpful living and the healing of the sick a priority through our ministry to the poor and oppressed. Cooperate with the Creator in His compassionate work of restoration. And we engage in Christ-like servants. Imagine this. We are up against Satan. Don't you ever believe that you can play against the devil and you're going to win? He's quite clever. He knows your ups and downs. And he engages in the destruction of your body with the ultimate goal to cloud your mind and judgment. As I was coming here, I thought I was going to be here. An hour earlier, and I got held behind because I was dealing with something in administration at the hospital. Something super silly. I walked into a room, and I see a 22-year-old guy, okay? He's complaining of headaches. He keeps having these headaches, and he tells me, they're not going away. You're not doing your job. They're not going away. I take a look. I take a step back, take a look at his room, and his room was full of sodas, pop, or whatever you want to call it. Mountain Dew, 17 cans of Mountain Dew in his room, in the hospital. It's supposed to be a place of healing, but he kept requesting Mountain Dew, Mountain Dew, Mountain Dew. So it turns out he was drinking eight Mountain Dew a day for breakfast and five to seven for lunch. Can you imagine the amount of sugar? You're basically effectively drunk with all that caffeine and sugar going on in his, in his brain. So I finally ended up seeing what's going on. That's why your sugars keep climbing to five, 600, you know, and insulin is not going to do anything to that. The pills, nothing. It's not about that. It's about getting the real problem. So I told him, hey, I can't, you know, I, I'm not going to tell you what I told him, but ultimately I changed the diet to where he was not supposed to get sodas, and he, gets su- he got super mad. He made a fit. And he taught, called administration. How dare the, that doctor take my sodas away? This is what we're up against. You know, and it's not about the guy. It's about Satan controlling the minds of people through food, through poor lifestyle choices. And ultimately, they don't even have a chance when they're confronted with right and wrong. Make a helpful living a priority in your life. Okay? I'm going to stop right now because somebody else is talking. But tomorrow I'm going to give you pretty cool, actually, examples of what service looks like in our country, overseas, and in my hometown. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brutus. Uh, Now we've got a little... um, glimpse of uh, what we're going to be enjoying this weekend. Our next speaker is uh, Esther Juarez. Um, she is somebody that uh, we actually have done, uh, uh, we have gone literally around the world t- teaching others about um, uh, how you can use the tools that we have in order to make an impact worldwide. And she's coming to us uh, from Weimar, California. So, Esther, it's your time. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Eddie, for the invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I think they're going to, okay, so let me practice. Where do I point? There you go. Okay. So, as he said, my name is Esther, I'm a nurse, and I'm a teacher in Weimar University, so I'm very happy to be here. Tomorrow we'll have more chance to 
to talk, but let me start uh, talking about what we're going to talk tonight is lifestyle coaching. And it's basically how to be a friend. Anyone here needs to learn how to be a friend? I think all of us. So uh, I'm going to just review the method and the way we do things at Weimar, and hopefully we can share something uh, valuable uh, with you tonight. So just to let you know, I base this class on number one, inspiration, so Bible and spirit of prophecy, scientific evidence, and life experience. So I want to start uh, tonight by telling you uh, something that happened to me when I was 13 years old. Uh, we were camping with pathfinders, and I went uh, swimming with my friend. My f we were in the, there was a river. So my friend was taller and bigger than me, very strong. Uh, she was older than me, but she didn't know how to swim. Uh, the river was not very, the water was not very deep. Uh, it was like down to here, but then, you know, you, the river had very nice currents and we start playing. I didn't think she, she was in any danger. I was a very good swimmer, uh, but she didn't know how to swim at all. So anyway, we had the great idea of letting ourselves go through the current and you know how that goes. So all of a sudden, the, the river is very deep and there was a whirlpool. So that pulled us down into the water and all I could see, those are not actual pictures, these are from the internet, but you see that, uh, that light? Uh, that's, uh, that's how I remember. I was just looking at the light and the light was just going, you know, farther away from, from us. And my friend was right on top of me, kicking me on my head. And I could tell she was panicking. I was trying to swim up, but the whirlpool was very strong. So I quickly, I uh, pray. You know that short prayer, four-letter prayer? Have you ever prayed that prayer? What is that prayer? Help. And then uh, I, kept, I kept swimming, but I said, you know, in three minutes we'll be dead if I don't do something. So what I did, I started uh, swimming in a diagonal diagonal. Uh, line, you know, and I knew she was going to sink deeper, but then I had a chance to help her because if we're both drowning, we're going to both, you know, be dead. So she grabbed my leg when I was swimming that way, and you want to guess, we, we made it out, and God helped us. So this is an, an uh, analogy that I, when I talk about uh, coaching, I talk about this story because when we're coaching, uh, I want you to remember that we can, once you learn about coaching, you're going to be doing this with friends, family members, and with everyone in life. And in life, you're going to meet people that have less knowledge. They're going to have less uh, skills, maybe emotional or, you know, any type, you can name it. Um, and you're going to have the skills. So think about yourself as one who is uh, swimming and you know how to swim, but maybe there are others that don't know how to swim. So what are you going to do about that, about the one that's drowning that doesn't have the skills? So in this story, I want you to remember that I kept swimming. So in coaching, you're helping someone, but you're also, you also have to keep swimming. So you're actually helping yourself. You keep going but you're, you're helping someone else. And by you helping someone el else, do you have to make more effort or less effort? You have to make more effort, uh, and you have to keep swimming towards life, right? Because you want your life to be saved, but also their life to be saved. You really care. And when she's grabbing my leg, who is making the effort? I'm making the effort, but is she making some type of effort? Whatever she was able to do, she has to cooperate with, with you. So when you're helping someone, uh, we're going to learn tomorrow more about this, that you have to allow them to join you in the journey, but you're actually uh, helping them, but they have to do something. So in the Spirit of Prophecy, Ministry of Healing, we are told the need of the world. What is the need? A revelation of Christ. So the same need, it's been there. We need a revelation. Any synonym for the word revelation? 
Revelation. How do you say revelation? Another word for revelation. What is a revelation? Manifestation? Is that the same? When you reveal something, you are doing what? You're showing. You demonstrate. So this is what we need. And she wrote it a hundred, more than 100 years ago. It says 1,900 years ago, the same need. So I would say now more than how many years? More than 2020. A great work of reform is demanded, and it is only through the grace of Christ that the work of restoration, and what is the type of restoration that God wants to accomplish? Is it just physical? Physical, mental, and spiritual can be accomplished. So the, the, the main need, it's a revelation of who? Of Jesus Christ. So now is the time, and when she wrote it, it was urgent, and I believe now it's even more urgent. We have come to a time when every member, does it say the pastor and the Bible worker, the health ministries director, or everyone, everyone, okay, in the church, should take hold of what? Medical missionary work. And every time we say medical missionary work, we're talking about benevolence work. So it sounds medical, but we're not talking about open heart surgery. We're talking about benevolence work and revealing the love of God. So we'll learn more about that. Everywhere people are perishing for lack of a knowledge of the truth that has been committed to us. The members of the church are in need of what? An awakening that they may realize the responsibility to impart this truth. So we have a treasure, and that's why we have a big responsibility. Now, this is what we call the cycle of evangelism. Are you able to see it? This, it's too small. So it has 10 steps. Uh, this is what we do in Weimar, and tomorrow we'll learn more about um, some of the steps. But step one, can someone read it? What, is, what does it say, step one at the top? Revival and reformation. You notice that which one comes first, revival or reformation? Revival. Many times we try to reform our external uh, self, but we actually have to start with revival, which is the awakening of your spiritual uh, the Holy Spirit is the one that has to start from the internal self, and then reformation will come. So revival and reformation, uh, uh, think about why do, I do, why do we do it? What, what are the reasons behind me wanting to be an evangelist or me want, wanting to teach? What, what are the reasons? We need revival and reformation. And then we do activation, which is what we're doing right now. Right now, we're trying to come together and learn from each other and encourage you to go out and, and evangelize and, and share what you have. This is activation of the church. Then you have to go out to the community because we reach the community next door. The responsibility of the local church is to reach our churches around us, our communities around us. I can go overseas. I can go all the way to Asia or Africa and do a mission trip, and that's okay. But what about next door, right? So maybe they need to come from Asia and Africa to my neighborhood because I'm not doing it right here. So this is what we need to do. And that's what TCI is. Uh, you go out, you assess your community needs, and then you develop and plan uh, public health events and community programs. And so number four, five, and six are local community programs, cooking classes, all types. And in our church, we have so many. We have addiction uh, programs. You just have to buy it and use it. You don't even need to develop the, the type of program yourself. There are many, many good uh, resources in our church that we can use. So then we, we offer this to the community, and then the community will come. But what about the personal relationship? That's where coaching uh, comes into uh, practice. That's number seven, Bible-based uh, lifestyle coaching, which is uh, I've seen many times that we invite people to come to a community 
uh, event, a health expo, diabetes undone, depression recovery, the CHIP program. You have heard of any of uh, some of these programs, right? And I've seen uh, some of us as church members, we come because we like to learn and be involved, maybe. But we don't talk to the guests. We don't talk to the visitor. We don't talk. Maybe we're shy. Maybe we think we're going to bother the person. So, uh, and then they go. So they come eight, for eight weeks to a program or four weeks if you have a community, you know, cooking classes. Or just one day if the, it's like a clinic. And then they go back home. And we didn't build a friendship. I know it's not easy to build a friendship in one day or a, or a couple of, of, you know, classes, especially if they're here for the class. But when you offer lifestyle coaching, you are actually uh, offering friendship. And a Bible coach, uh, a Bible-based uh, lifestyle coach is just like a Bible worker in disguise. So you're going to start, if they came to a community program related to health, they, they're probably struggling with health issues. So if you're doing, uh, uh, for example, diabetes undone program, maybe they have diabetes. So if you offer a free service where you can, uh, you say, you know, you can make a flyer and just you invite them to participate in a lifestyle coaching program, then you just continue uh, to meet with them, and little by little, you're going to start developing the friendship. And after that, if they're interested in spiritual uh, matters, then you can start Bible studies. And we have many, many experiences where the, the person is now a member of the church because we were, uh, first, we were helping them in their lifestyle situations. It could be social problems. It could be physical problems. It could be emotional or mental. So we help. We make friends, they, they, we win their confidence, and then they come and they want to know more about our church. So <clears throat> I want you to notice uh, the language that the spirit of prophecy is telling us. In medical ministry, it's uh, the same as Habakkuk 2.14, where it says that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What is covering this, the, 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 the earth? The knowledge of the glory of the Lord. What is the glory of the Lord? Do you know that? His character. And what is his character? Let's define. I love definition. What is his character? Love. Now, is there a fake love out there? You think? You think that if there's something real uh, and beautiful, you think that Satan is going to fake it or try to have a counterfeit? Of course. So the real love is what we need that, that is going to surround uh, the earth as the waters cover the sea. Now, in medical ministry, uh, we are told that we shall see the medical missionary work broadening and deepening at every point of its progress because of the inflowing of hundreds and thousands of streams until the whole earth is what? Covered as the waters cover the sea. So that tells me that medical missionary work equals the glory of the Lord. So we're going to talk more about that. Now, uh, we are told that Jesus received wounds on his hands, right, when he dies. So who heals the wounds of Jesus? Have you ever asked that question? I'm a, uh, right now, I'm a nurse, and right, uh, the last three years I've been working healing wounds. I never thought I would like that, Dr. Eddie, really. I, 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 I used to work in labor and delivery forever, uh, for 20 years. But then life happens, and then I start working home health. All types of wounds. I'm fascinated by wounds, especially when we use uh, charcoal and honey and clay and home remedies. So I, that's another area I like, home remedies. But Jesus had wounds, right? Was he 100% human? He was 100% God, but was he 100% human? You think it hurt? So who healed his wounds? Did he say who heals 
his wound. In Matthew 24, 25, 40, he says that when we do something nice and good, right, when we visit someone that, ne- that is in jail, someone that's in the hospital, when we do something to one of his creatures, to his creation, does he love all of us? So when we are mean, we're doing it to him. And when we are nice, we're being nice to who? To Jesus, right? So he says that when we do this, we are doing it to him. Uh, now, the, 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 the earth is full of darkness and the truth of God, which is his character of love, it has to disperse the lies of Satan. That's how it is. So we can be on the side of the truth or we can be on the side of the lies. There's no middle point. So we are supposed to hold up this light. Jesus is the son of righteousness. We are little beams. It can be a big beam of light. It can be a small beam of light. But darkness cannot exist even with a little, if I bring a little clicker, a little, the matches, how do you call the clicker? Encendedor? A lighter. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. So just a little light. Just a little light. It doesn't matter how small it is. Who wins? The dark room or the light? Every single time, right? So it doesn't matter. Uh, she says that you, your work is to hold up your light. It doesn't matter how little it is. Your work is to hold it up and light other lights. That's why I like training. Because I believe in the factor of multiplication. Because if I train 10 then 10 will do the work, not just me. And then if if 10 go out and train more, did Jesus train trainers? Right? So a true disciple should train more so that the work will will, uh, be multiplied. And then she says, light other lights. Do not be discouraged if your light is not a great light. If it is only a penny taper, hold it up. You know the penny tapers? That little candles, very small, hold it up and let it shine. Do your best and God will bless your effort. So what is Bible-based uh, lifestyle coaching? Is it important? Should we learn about it? So this is the method. If you forget everything that Esther said Friday night, oh, she keeps talking. I don't understand what she's saying. I want to remember this. And I think Amanda was going to print Uh, this handout. So the method is here, uh, and I call it the PSP method. So why learn lifestyle coaching? Uh, Well, there is a great work to be done. Do you believe that? Before satanic opposition shall close up the way and our present opportunities for labors shall be lost. Time is rapidly passing. So right now, I believe we have a window of opportunity. But the time is coming where we're not going to have the opportunities we have now. Have you seen some opportunities that close right now? It's traveling harder, right? So <clears throat> we need to work. Christ is waiting. Now, I'm so in shock when I read this every single time. Uh, yes, I'm a little dramatic. I'm Mexican. They say we're kind of dramatic. But... Um, it's not that I'm dramatic. This is very, to me, it's very disrespectful. Would you make someone wait? No one, but someone important even, even, even worse, right? Do you make someone wait? We're making Jesus wait. It says Christ is waiting. And then he's waiting how? Impatiently? Is he frustrated? Maybe he is, but. It says that he's waiting with longing desire for what? For the manifestation. Here is that word again. Showing, manifesting, right? Of who? Himself. In who? In us. So we need to reveal him to the world. And when the character of Christ, what is the character? Love shall be perfectly reproduced in who? In us. 
Then he will come to claim them as his own. He's waiting. He's waiting for this, for the true love. The last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation or manifestation, right, of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory in their own life and character. They are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. So we receive, we need to give. And the method that we use to reach people is his method. It's not my method. There's nothing more beautiful than a simple gospel message. Because it's so beautiful. You, you cannot beautify. You cannot make it more beautiful. And we try, and then we ruin things. Because it's, it's really simple and beautiful in itself. So Jesus shows the method in his life. That's why he came. Christ's method alone will give true success. If we want to have success in reaching the people, we need to use his method. The Savior mingle with men. Another word for mingle? Interact. He had good contact with them, right? As one who really cared, right? As one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, minister to their needs. So it's not about my needs, it's their needs. And won their confidence. And then, this is the last step. Then he bade them, follow me. So first we need to mingle. And then we have to show sympathy for them. And then we need to minister to their needs. And then when they're confident, this comes automatically. And then we invite them to follow Jesus, right? So what is the PSP method? Let's talk about the PSP method. Uh, first, we have the problem. In order to find the solutions, first we have to find the problem. Uh, the doctor mentioned the, that that soda has caffeine. A lot of caffeine is not only the sugar, but it has caffeine. Uh, some, some people don't know that that one is one of the highest content, caffeine content. Uh, of course, he had headaches. Uh, anyway, so everyone has problems. Anyone here with no problems? Raise your hand. Um, maybe that's a problem if you think you don't have problems. So, see, God gives you happiness. And people look for uh, happiness outside God. But they're actually trying to, they think that when they look for pleasures, that's going to give them happiness. But happiness is above pleasure. What am I trying to say? God gives you pleasure because he loves you. So he gives you a fruit. It's beautiful. You can look at it and it's beautiful, the color, the flavor. So he gives you pleasure. But above all, he gives you what? Happiness. When you look for pleasures in life that are outside God's will, outside his love, you're never going to receive happiness. So God gives you happiness, and within this happiness, he throws pleasure. Uh, think about that. Tomorrow we can talk more about it. But the problem is that we focus in the problems in the wrong way. We need, I, I call it peel and onion. So when you have a problem, like a headache, right? You need to find what's the cause of this headache. What are the causes for headaches? Uh, there's like a hundred. Well, name, name one. Dehydration. Yes. What else? What? Caffeine, yeah. If you're not, um, if you're not, if you didn't eat breakfast, if you didn't sleep well, if you're stressed, many, many causes for a headache, right? And if right now the fire alarm goes off and it's like very loud. Now in California, we had a lot of fires. And they will, they will think I'm crazy if I get my shoe and throw it there because I want to keep talking. Who, who would leave the church right now? If Okay, the alarm is silenced now. So does that mean there's no problem anymore? 
Who would stay with me? You leave. Crazy Esther can keep talking, right? Because there is a fire. So when you have something going on, you have to stop and think. What are the underlying problems? So there's something at the heart, and the spirit of prophecy tells us that 90% of our problems start where? In the mind. She's not saying you are imagining the problem. It starts in the mind because when you make a decision, the choices, where do you make your choices? What do you use? The stomach? The pancreas? What do you use to make choices? The mind, right? So uh, we need to get to the core of the problem. So when you start peeling onions, uh, if you find, for example, diabetes, if you peel that onion, how did you get there, okay? Any problem. And then at the core, we can find things that maybe, maybe the person doesn't even know they have at the core. Maybe childhood, uh, unpleasant childhood memories. Toxic feelings like emotional pain, maybe fear, uh, shame, guilt. So if you have maybe shame, guilt, all these ideas that you don't even know, maybe you do, you're going to try to cover that because it's not pleasant. And then people start getting bitter. When you see a bitter person, don't think they're bitter. They're sad. So they get energy to, to keep going in life with bitterness because that gives you a little more adrenaline. But it's actually a deeper problem, that bitterness. So you start developing layer on top of layer. Now, the, the, the other layer is that you start masking the problems at the core and you start deciding or choosing unhelpful practices. And that's how the onion or one layer gets, you know, on top of the next layer. Uh, so the problem is that when the habits, when the, these choices become a habit, then you start, you, now you're having, you know, deeper and more problems, like uh, problems that are not, uh, maybe not diagnosed yet, but they start having, um, uh, they start showing, like uh, water retention, insomnia, all these are like symptoms they're telling you there's something wrong, but maybe you don't have a diagnosis yet. But then it comes to diagnosis. And usually the person is going to seek for help once they're in the fourth layer. Once they have a problem, they say, I have a problem. I have diabetes. I have, you know, hypertension. Any problem, they're going to come to you once the system receives so much abuse that it broke completely. So once we have uh, a problem... You are facing someone, you are trying to help someone with a problem. You need to think they have this problem, they want to reverse this problem, but it actually uh, we need to work on all the underlying situations. So to find the solutions, uh, this is my favorite uh, definition of health and disease, and it explains what to do. So disease is an effort of nature to free the system, from the conditions that result from violation of the laws of health. Maybe not, maybe I didn't break it, maybe people around me will break it, maybe genetics and, so, and my parents broke it, but the point is that the laws of health have been broken. So then disease comes. When, when we have a problem with sickness, what are the steps that we have to follow? Number one, we, uh, she says we need to find what? The cause, number one. And then we have to work on changing what? Unhelpful conditions. And then correct wrong habits. What are the difference? What is the difference between two and three? What is uh, conditions versus habits? Can, can you really have control over conditions? Not always, not every time, right? But you can change or move out of some environment that is unhelpful. But the habits, it's definitely you. Don't even blame the devil. Because you, we have free will. And habits need to be what? Corrected. And doctors have a hard time 
trying to educate patients because the patient has to decide. And sadly, many times, you know, patients are disobedient and stubborn. So that's the reality of human beings. And then number four, that's my area and my favorite, which is therapies. Then you help uh, the body because the body is going to start recovering. Then you help. Then there's the medicine. Then there's the, there are the therapies and the treatments, right? Assisting nature in the restoration, pr restoration, pro restoration process and uh, detoxing, right? Or reversing the problem. That's the solution. Now, the process, remember the, 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 the method is PSP. So the first P is what? Problem. And then the S, solution. And then we have the coaching experience, which is based in John 14, 17. So for tomorrow, I want you to study John 14 through 17. And we're going to uh, learn, and tomorrow we're going to expand. So we're going to repeat and expand the way, the truth, and the life. So basically, all the coaching methods out there are based in biblical principles. What did I say? The coaching methods out there are based on the Bible, even methods that are not Christian methods, because they're based on love. They're based on, on the way God is with us. And Jesus, he explains uh, when Thomas, so never, never get mad with a student that is asking questions, because Questions lead to answers. Jesus said, I'm leaving, I'm going, you know where I'm going. And then Thomas says, I don't know where you're going. We don't know, how can we know the way? And then Jesus said, I am, what? The way, the truth, and the life. So these three, three things, he didn't even say, I'm the way, because he was as asking about the way. But he explained the way, the truth, and the life. So basically the way, uh, when you think about the way, Jesus is the way. The way where? What was he talking about? So Jesus came to this world to show us the way. The way somewhere, right? Where is, where is this place? So when God created Adam and Eve... Did he create them with a lot of mistakes and faults and imperfections? No. Was that lost, this perfection? It was lost, right? So when Jesus comes, he's showing the way back to his ideal and the creation and what he had in mind at the beginning. He's showing who God is. So that is, that is where. So we are going back to heaven, back home, back to the Father. That's the way. Who is showing us the way if we don't know the way? You ever get lost? I have this uh, weird thing. It's a secret, but now it's not. It's called spatial dyslexia. You know how many times I get lost? When it's horrible. It's really bad. Anyone here gets lost easily? It's horrible. You feel like, okay, where's the north? Where's the south? So to know the way when you are going, you need to know where you're going. Like the doctor said when he was saying, you have a purpose. And if we don't know where we're going, if we forget, maybe we know, but we forget and we lose the, the, the focus, then you're just wondering. You're just going like this in life. So we need to have a definite aim. We need to know, we need to have a vision of what is it that I want? What is it that God wants from me? And this is based on the Bible. And then, so the way is going to answer the question, where am I going? And then he says, I am the truth. What is the truth? That's, that's a deep question. What is the, what truth is he talking about? What is why is Jesus the definition of the truth? There was a lie in heaven. What was Lucifer's lie? He doesn't care. He doesn't love you. He's selfish. Everything that was Satan, he was actually saying, this big lie, 
and everything was saying that God was. That was a big lie. And what was the only way that God was able to demonstrate that that was a lie? Getting rid of, uh, getting rid of Lucifer? Can you imagine? Did he um, deceive thousands of angels, perfect angels, smart angels? So Jesus had to manifest. How to what? How to demonstrate. How to show. Uh, he is the perfect expression. Now, how many here speak more than one language? Ooh, a lot of you. Very nice. But have you ever heard about the language of heaven? No, it's not Spanish. I know. Hispanics say it's Spanish. The language of heaven, you want to know what the language of heaven is? The language of heaven is in John chapter 1. Is action. The language of, because the father didn't say, I'm so sorry, Adam and Eve, you're in such trouble. I'll send you the Bible. And I'll send you a manual. I'll send you instructions. Step by step, I'll tell you what to do. He could have done that, right? He comes here stretching his righteous right arm. How do you hug someone who is, especially if someone is hurting, right? You use your arms. So God is actually stretching his arms by sending his only son as a perfect expression of a message. What was this message? I love you. I care. I'm with you, and I'm going to help you out, right? And he comes and he walks side by side with me. He doesn't let go. Now, did he do this if I'm a nice person? If I say, yes, yes, go ahead and come. No, even, if, even for those who reject him, he comes because that's who he is. That is the truth. God is love, and he has a perfect plan for you to prosper. Okay, let's repeat it because I like that phrase. God is love, and he has a perfect plan for you to prosper. And it's not this prosperity gospel that is the fake love. That is not being prosper. What is, what is prosperity? Salvation, life and health, right? Eternal life. So that is the truth. What is the truth? If I ask you next time, God is love, true love. And he has a perfect plan for us to prosper. And so that is, that is what? What is it? His love, his plan, perfect plan, better than any plan you can imagine. He has a plan for us. And then the third one is the life. And I believe here is where we fail many times. Because we try to make things on our own. And the message of righteousness by faith is hidden right, right here, the life. Because I consecrate my life every day, Steps to Christ tells you, right? Every morning, not at night, in the morning. You surrender. You give your plans, your ideas, but you actually tell him to guide your plans and your ideas and your life and everything. If we learn to walk with Jesus, then he is going to tell you not only what to do, but how to do it. What did I say? Not only what to do, but how to do it. And when we learn to live like that, it's actually him through his Holy Spirit, inspiring my heart to live according to his mind, according to his will, and then I'm going to be happy. And then I'm going to share with others. So he came to restore in men the image of his maker to bring him back to the perfection in which he, ha he was created to promote the development of body and mind and soul that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. So Jesus is the creator. And everything that comes from God 
is going to create and is going to lead to life in all the, all the aspects of life. It's never going to lead to destruction. It, that's not. That's, that destruction, yes, it will come, but it's called a strange act because God creates what? Life. Can Satan create life? Wait and see if in the thousand years, in the millennium, wait and see if he creates something out of this chaos, right, that this planet is going to be. You think he's going to be able to create or recreate or even restore something? No, because he's an angel. He's not a creator. Uh, even men are very creative, and man can really make a lot of things because we are made in the image of our Father, our Creator, God. But everything that God does is it leads to life. So Jesus comes as the creator God who he is to restore. And when you are working with someone else, you are working in the direct opposition to the destroyer. You think it's, he's going to let you just, okay, just go ahead and, and do this uh, medical missionary work, this medical ministry, this benevolence work. Go out and knock on doors. Uh, I'm going to leave you alone. No, it's a th big threat for him. When we are loving people, when we're manifesting God's character and his glory to the world, Satan really, he really trembles. Why? Because then Jesus is going to come. Because then when the whole earth is surrounded by this glory, by this love in action, then Jesus is going to come. So, happy Sabbath and uh, looking forward to tomorrow. We're going to keep talking more in detail about the PSP method. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, I hope that this starts to put those seeds in our hearts of how to use this coaching method to encourage somebody to do those positive changes and bring them closer to Jesus. How did you enjoy the program tonight? <laughs> so tomorrow we'll continue. Uh, we'll start at 9.45 for a song service. And um, I hope to see each one of you here. Let us close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the plan that you have and for allowing us to be part of that plan. Lord, may this weekend be an inspiration to each one of us. Help us to understand that purpose that you have for each one of us, that mission that you have given us. May you help us to continue to grow and may we be able to cooperate with you to finish this work that you have for us. We thank you and be with us this night in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a